Welcome to Careful Consideration of Our Common Concerns. I'm Dr. Ted Noel. This is going to be the first installment on the subsidy that the U.S. government gives to drug dealers and its problems. It's a bit long, so we've broken it into two parts. And we'll take a look at why it's such a big problem and why we need to understand the issues involved. First of all, remember that the law of subsidy, if you search for it, you won't find it in any of the economics literature. You'll find discussions of what subsidies do and so on, but nobody's bothered to call it the law of subsidy. They just haven't done it. In any case, Last year, actually 2017, the Fed in estimated that there were over 70,000 opioid overdoses in the U.S. That's a bunch. And they said 42,000 of them had fentanyl as part of what's going on. Now, according to them, we obviously have to outlaw those drugs. Before we go any further, please allow me to establish my bona fides. First of all, I am an anesthesiologist. Opioids are my stock in trade. I use them in my practice for everything. I have literally administered gallons of fentanyl. It's one of the safest drugs known to man. That's what I said. It's safe. It is an extremely safe drug. And opioids are essential in controlling pain, which brings me to my second bona fide and I'm going to stand up so you can see it. You see, I just had major surgery on my right shoulder, and that required opioids for pain control. It is essential, and anybody who says you only need them for two or three days is just uninformed. I have been about... 11 days down, 12 days down, and I've needed them off initially on a regular schedule, and over the last four days, I've still needed some. I've had days with none and days with some. So it's one of those things where opioids are important for extended periods. Anybody who tells you anything different is a liar or they don't know what they're talking about. So let's get to reality. We have laws against opioids anywhere except by prescription, and now we have laws that restrict prescriptions. I mean, that's insane. Why do we have laws like that? There's no need for them. As we look at things, we've intercepted literally tons of opioids at the U.S.-Mexico border. We found them on ships. We have a recent video of Marines or Border Patrol or somebody jumping on a semi-submersible that turned out to be loaded with opioids. Why in the world would anybody want to scream, you know, get all that stuff in there? You know, think about it. All of those drugs have been around for a long time. All of them cost the same as aspirin to make literally the fact they only cost the price of aspirin and yet el chapo has roughly 12 billion dollars that he made off of drugs that the u.s government is trying to seize now now we know that the u.s government didn't write a check to el chapo for 12 billion so why did he get rich selling aspirin anytime anybody talks to you about drugs ask that question why did El Chapo get rich selling a drug that costs the same as aspirin? Because I know that you aren't spending a big part of your personal budget on aspirin. You'll buy a bottle that'll last you for months or a year or two years, depending on what's going on. You spent four or five bucks. It's, it's silly. Now let's look at some history. And we're just going to zip through it as quickly as I can because there's just so much information here. Opium was originally extracted from the opium poppy, the sap of the poppy. Now, my mom grew opium poppies, but not for the opium. She loved the pretty little orange flowers. But if you cracked the stem, there was a milky sap that would come out. 
And anybody who wanted to could have sucked on that sap and gotten enough opium to get some effect. That opium acted on a receptor that we discovered in 1974. We knew it worked, we just didn't know how it worked. And the drug that we'd been using forever is a derivative of opium. It's a little bit refined, it's called morphine. And those receptors are stimulated normally by hormones you make, which are endogenous, that means they're made from inside. They are endogenous morphine and became known as endorphins. That receptor is also why people get the runner's high. And the purpose of it really is not to give you the high. Rather, it allows the body to produce pain-relieving compounds that let you get through an emergency. If you're not in an emergency, you don't make endorphins to shut down on pain. But think about all the people who've had broken bones and have managed to push on through because there was some sort of an emergency and then afterwards they need to get things tended to. That's why it's there. God built us marvelously. Now, Yale University notes that around 5,000 years ago, ancient Sumerians used these natural narcotics to get high. Well, think about where Sumer is. That's in Mesopotamia or Iraq, just south of Turkey. And the modern history of opium starts with Turkish traders who brought opium to China. And this was during the Tang Dynasty. And it became very valuable because it was produced a long way away, had great effects, and it was actually used as a form of money. In 1729, Emperor Young Chong made smoking opium illegal. That's how people would use it. They would put it in a pipe and smoke it. Think about uh, marijuana. Think about cocaine. Yeah, same idea. You have a drug delivery system. He makes it illegal, and all that does is create crime. So now you have people saying, people want this. This stuff's valuable. Uh, Let's figure out a way to get around the police. And a lot of people got involved in smuggling. And the next year, there were 15 long tons of opium imported into China. 30 years later, it was 75 long tons. So you can tell prohibition really worked well. And pretty soon, you have Americans and others join the big trading party. In 1810, the emperor made the use of opium completely illegal. Quote, it was undermining our good customs and morality, end quote. And of course, this prohibition worked really well. By 1838, the number of opium addicts in China grew from 4 to 12 million. So we got to do something. And if this story sounds like what we're doing in the United States, it should. Because the issue here has nothing to do with the drug. It has everything to do with economics the law of subsidy. The government seized opium factories in Canton, and remember when we had 40 long tons of opium? They destroyed 1,000 long tons of opium. So in about 80 years, you have a whole bunch of steps of increasing prohibition. And what do they do? They increase the use of the drug over 100 times. And something else had to be done, and of course that something turned into the Opium Wars, where Britain forced their way into the market. And of course the Americans got into the market before long. In 1863, you had the Taiping Rebellion, and a lot of people said, I'm getting out of here. They came to America and went to work building the Transcontinental Railroad. They brought with them their preference for opium as their intoxicant of choice. The way they did this is they'd work six days out on the railroad, they're off their day off, they go into the nearest shanty town, they buy a little opium with their paycheck, they smoke it, they get high, they get happy, they get relaxed, they sleep it off, and the next day they're back at work. Notice that opium does not make people antagonistic, belligerent, etc. That's not the way it works. It has sedative and soporific effects. 
there's a lot of stuff going on about this time. You have patent medicines that may or may not have any effect. Some of them may or may not have any active ingredients. And they answered the need that people wanted for help me grow hair, help me uh, regain my potency, help me fix my arthritis, or whatever else. And sometimes stuff worked, sometimes it didn't. So now you've got all of this hucksterism, and you have something else that has existed since the beginning of time. It's called racism. Chinese people don't look like Caucasians. Everybody in America was either European descent, Native American, who were hated again, racism, or Chinese, hated as racists. You know, here we are. So what do you do? You have the labor unions led by Samuel Gompers of the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions claiming that the Chinese, when they smoked opium, kidnapped white women who were forced to, quote, yield up their virgin bodies to their maniacal yellow captors, end quote. Uh, Nothing like that ever happened. Didn't stop Gompers from saying it. He was being absolutely, totally racist, protecting his union. And, of course, the Chinese became the Yellow Peril. And you have a series of legal restrictions. In 1875, the Page Act prevented Chinese women from coming to the U.S. In 1882, you had the Chinese Exclusion Act, which said no new Chinese could come to the U.S. If you're here, you can have kids, whatever else, but you can't bring anybody in from outside. And by the way, that lasted deep into the 20th century. Pure racism. And none of the charges against the Chinese were based in reality. The opium they smoked on days off did not result in the aggressive behavior gompers pushed. It was a lie, pure and simple, a lie. But we never hear lies in politics. Oh, no, 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 no. In any case, we start in 1906 with laws against opium. And this goes again in multiple steps where you first tax it, then you restrict it, you end up outlawing it. And through a whole long step of laws, you have racism institutionalized by narcotic prohibition. And, of course, Mexicans, remember, they don't look like us. They have Mayan descent, so they have a different look in their faces. And a lot of them spoke Spanish. Their favorite drug was cocaine. Excuse me. Their favorite drug was marijuana. And so marijuana laws get pushed. Again, racial exclusion. In the South, you have blacks. Their favorite drug was cocaine. And uh, it came to the U.S. in 1884. And remember, this is after the Civil War. And you have all of the, the Southern Democrats angry that they lost the war. They pushed all the Jim Crow laws, everything they could do to exclude blacks, to segregate, to keep the blacks from having any civil rights. And here's another chance to have a law against the blacks. So cocaine got treated to the legal approach. I mean, you have a number of steps. 1906, you have yellow journalism and all of the propaganda. And what happens? You whip up this fever against these unwanteds. You add all of the moralists, the preachers, whatever else. Oh, these evils. Gompers has his yellow peril. You have the evil. We have to protect against that evil. And ultimately, we end up with, drumroll please, laws. And you have those laws because there is this huge motivation for a legislator to do something. We have an evil. I have to act against it. It doesn't matter whether it's real. I have to act against it. Orange man, bad. I have to act against him. doesn't matter whether it's real or not. You're a legislator. You have to do something. You can't sit back and not do something, even when not doing something is the right answer. 
of course, all of these things failed just as badly in the U.S. as they did in China. All of these people ignore Einstein's maxim, which says, as you will recall, that insanity is doing something a second time and expecting a different result. Part of the problem is that no one ever measures the results. If you get a bad result, they blame it on not doing enough. It's kind of like saying, I have overdrawn my bank account, so I didn't spend enough money. I have to spend more. Maybe that will fix overdrawing my bank account. Makes about as much sense. Ultimately, we have a motivation by people who want to gain an advantage. You had trade unions wanted an advantage against the Chinese. As we look at the home remedy stuff, the uh, patent medicines, you have allopathic physicians. Happen, I happen to be one. They're the form, people with formal scientific training. They want to stamp out the home remedies. We would call them homeopathic now or natural remedies now. And so they say we've got to have laws against various drugs. Pharmacists wanted to keep the docs from, from dispensing drugs. There's money to be made there. So they wrote the rules so that you couldn't dispense drugs. You had to go to a pharmacist to get them. On and on. Everybody is clawing for a way to fatten his own wallet. Once again, each time something comes up, for example... Docs are getting rich off of these prescriptions because they write the prescription and send people across to another desk in their own office to get it filled. They're making money on both sides of this thing. That's evil. Oh, and so now you get laws where doctors cannot prescribe and dispense medicines. Oh, but that benefits the pharmacists, not the doctors. You have everybody trying to find a way to fix an evil to help their own wallet. Politicians are happy to help out. One of the key things to think about, though, is that opium has been used safely for millennia. You heard me right, for thousands of years. Everybody knew that when they smoked opium, they were going to get a dose that made them high, made them happy. They could put it down when they got enough effect, and that's that. In the Horn of Africa, you had people who would chew cot. You chew it enough, you get enough effect, you get your intoxicant. You go to South America, you have people chewing coca leaf. When they get the effect they want, the buzz, the relaxation, whatever, hey, they can put it down. They've got enough effect. When you go out to dinner, you can have wine when you've had a couple of glasses, you think you're feeling good, you don't order anymore. You don't need any more. People control their own use quite nicely. And what happens wrong with all of that? Not much. It's quite safe. You don't have people dying from overdoses. Now let's take a quick look at the opioids because we're going to focus on those. As I said before, your body makes opioids. These hormones are designed by God to help stop pain long enough for you to get out of an emergency. And the opioids are all the same drug in essence. You heard me right. They are all the same drug. The naturally occurring one in plant life is morphine. It's the pure form of opium. And if you give it through a vein, it lasts three or four hours, and you take about 10 milligrams as a standard dose for surgical pain. No big deal. You can take it orally, a little different onset, and then a little kitchen table chemistry, basically use a little vinegar, acetic acid, and you can turn morphine into, di in, uh, into heroin. That's diacetylmorphine. As a matter of fact, Bayer, the aspirin company, marketed it 
because, and they gave it the name heroin because it would be a heroic relief from pain. It's about twice as potent as morphine. You make another chemical substitution. You go to a little more complicated chemistry work and you turn morphine into dilaudid. Well, dilaudid is five times as potent as morphine. So where morphine takes 10 milligrams and heroin takes five, dilaudid takes two. What's the difference between the drug? Not much. They all last on an IV dose three to four hours. They all take about 30 or 40 minutes to come to full effect. And they all have the same side effects of making you sleepy, make you a little bit loopy, upset your stomach, slow down your bowels. In other words, they're all the same drug. So when we say heroin is bad and morphine is okay, no. People are lying to you. Those drugs are all the same. Then the chemists got busy and they said, um, let's see what else we can do. So now we start making drugs that aren't derived from morphine. And you end up with the fentanyl family. Uh, some of you will remember a drug called Demerol. doesn't get used much. And one that was called Talwin. That one kind of got pulled from the market. Those were early tries. But then you look at fentanyl, sufentanyl, remifentanyl, carfentanyl, alfentanyl. Oh, you didn't know there were that many fentanyls, did you? The only one of those I haven't used in clinical medicine is carfentanyl. Fentanyl starts a hundred times as potent as morphine. You heard me right, one hundred times as potent. I have personally administered fentanyl by the gallon. When we did heart surgery, one of the things we did was to deliberately give a massive overdose of fentanyl at the beginning of the procedure. Why? If somebody's taking a broad axe to your chest to split it open and do all of that work inside your chest, you need pain relief with capital letters as part of the procedure. What it does is it takes away the body's response to the surgical insult. Very, very safe. Then we can make whatever other manipulations we need to make things work. So fentanyl is exceedingly useful. It works very, very well. The differences between fentanyl and remifentanyl is basically time. One of the things we did, we learned with remifentanyl is that while it starts as quickly as fentanyl, which basically is the time from injection in the vein until it gets to your brain, a few seconds, remifentanyl goes away in less than 10 minutes, whereas fentanyl takes about 40 minutes. That means there are some short procedures where you can give a whopping dose of narcotic, shut it off, and it get rid of it very, very quickly because you don't need it anymore. There are some really nice uses for a drug like that. Dressing changes in burn units, really good idea. Uh, alfentanil, turned out didn't work all that well. Sufentanil, a little more potent than, than fentanyl easier to give big doses in heart surgery. Some places liked it, some didn't. But the point is they're all the same drug and they're all very, very good drugs. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that their side effects are all the same? They stop your breathing. They can give you an upset stomach on and on. But they work very, very well. I haven't talked about the codeine derivatives, oxycodone, hydrocodone, they ultimately get metabolized to morphine and act like morphine. So when we look at all of these drugs, they are the same drug. There is no difference whatever in the final analysis between the drugs. And do any of these drugs cause aggressive behavior? No, they cause sedation. Now, all of these drugs are also associated with a couple of phenomena that are really important medically. One is called tolerance. If you give a lot of drug for a long period of time, the receptor, remember we talked about that endorphin receptor, gets used to having the drug on it and it gets less sensitive. 
that means you need more drug. And I've seen patients in my practice where instead of getting 30 or 40 milligrams of morphine for a whole day of pain relief, they need three or 400 milligrams. That's 10 times as much. And it's just because they're tolerant. And some of these people are able to just function simple and easy as long as they get their drug. No big deal. Go out, you get on your maintenance. They do fine. They can do have nice productive lives. And while we're talking about maintenance, it's time for us to talk about Portugal. You see, Portugal in 2004 decriminalized all opiates. Having them, using them, is not a criminal act anymore. And they went one step further. If you're an addict, you sort of get certified, they'll provide you with your drug. And it costs Portugal about $4 a day. That's less than a latte at Starbucks. That includes the cost of the clinic, the cost of the record keeping, the cost of the drugs, everything. Oh, did I mention that the native cost of these various drugs is the same as aspirin? Yeah. Portugal is spending the same price as aspirin to maintain their addicts. What happened to their overdose rate? It's almost zero. It's the lowest in Europe and less than one-tenth of the rate in the United States. It is very small. Overdoses come from a different process. And we'll get there in just a minute. One other interesting thing about Portugal's approach is that people on maintenance programs are able to live productive lives and about half of them over 10 years wean themselves off of the drugs. No withdrawal. Which is my other point here. Withdrawal is the reason that people insist on getting back to drugs. If you are habituated, that's another fancy word, you're used to having the drug on board, and you suddenly stop it, your body says, that's not good, I need this drug. And you run through all of the possible things that they talk about with the withdrawal on TV, you know, the cramping, the upset stomach, the nausea, the vomiting, the chills, the, the whole long litany of horribles. And basically, those people are in a position where you go through it once, you don't ever want to go through it again. So what's the easiest way not to go through withdrawal? Go get more drug. Well, in Portugal... You just walk down to your clinic and get your daily dose of drug. No big deal. And they'll probably use methadone in an oral form, which will last 36 hours, half-life, something of that sort. And so you end up where you don't get withdrawal. You have maintenance. This is part of what is known as harm reduction. But the addict on the street in the United States can't do that you find that the addict on the street says, I have got to get my drug. And so what do they do? They start by exhausting their family money to buy drug. And when that runs out, they get into crime. They will steal things. They will sell things. That, you know, Some women will go into prostitution to collect enough money to get their fix. In other words, the crime is because of the money. And now we come back to the economics. Our problem here, ultimately, and this is why all of the enforcement models are doomed to fail, is something called the Iron Law of Prohibition. Now, the Iron Law of Prohibition basically says that if you have a substance that people want, and there's about 30% of the population that wants intoxicants. And you make it illegal, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to find a substitute or they're going to seek it out on the black market. 
with opioids, there's no substitute. With alcohol during prohibition, there was two. There were two substitutes. You could go get to an illegal dealer, uh, the speakeasies, the uh, Roaring Twenties stuff, the Al Capones. But with narcotics, you don't have ready access to it, so you have to find your curbside pharmacist. Well, he's doing something illegal to make money. An aspirin ain't going to get it. He says, if I'm risking my skin on an illegal action, you are going to provide me with a reward. You're going to pay me enough money to make it worth my while. But, of course, if I go and say, look, I'm getting this and you're making me pay for it, I want some value for my money so the price goes up and then he says well if you're going to get that rich stuff you're going to pay even more you get a vicious cycle it's called the iron law of prohibition but then once it becomes valuable enough the other guy looking in goes hey i can get that drug out here and i can sell it for a little bit less than him undercut we have a little bit of competition going on here and pretty soon We have dueling curbside pharmacists who are all setting themselves up for the death penalty as a result of a little hot lead from their competitor. In other words, you have crime that comes both on the supply and the demand side because we outlawed an intoxicant. An intoxicant that could be used and had been used for thousands of years without any problems regulated by the individual and i'm going to do one more thing here before i finish this segment there are two kinds of habituation the medical kind comes from people who are given narcotics to take care of pain Now, remember, I said I've been on them off and on for about 10 days. I've had three days out of the 10 where I've taken nothing. And the reason is that the level of pain has been low. And this is something we consistently see in patients with surgical pain. As they recover, the amount of narcotic they need goes away. You will find the occasional patient who needs no narcotic. And you'll find others who, at the point I'm at, will need three or four times as much as I do for maybe another week or more. And maybe 1%, and it depends on which study you read, but typically less than 1% of all of the addicts we have out on the street came from medical sources. You heard me right. Less than 1%. So prescription drugs for pain are not the issue. Now, prescription drugs for chronic pain do work, yet you have 60 minutes out there with their thing, well, there's no data that says it works. No, because we didn't bother to do the studies because we know it does work. We take care of patients. We don't sit there. We don't take, we don't treat paperwork. We treat patients. And there are people with chronic back pain. You all know them. You may not even be aware of it. These people have chronic back pain. They're on chronic narcotics. And they need medication for extended periods, days, months, years, maybe the rest of their life. You have also cancer patients who need it in large doses as they run through their last days. Just talk to hospice. Restrictions on the medical use of opioids are stupid. And we see a lot of patients who've been on chronic opioids who've had to be cut off because the docs are afraid of their licenses. And those people have gone on to commit suicide because the pain is too much. We are killing people by stupidity. But remember the motivations. Drugs are bad. No, they're not. Drugs are useful. They can also be used in a bad fashion, and that's the other way people get addicted. Curbside pharmacy, non-medical use of opioids, accounts for over 99% of all addiction. You heard me right. Non-medical use accounts for over 99%. Restrictions on doctors aren't the answer. 
But when you look at it, why are those people getting addicted? It's not because they had access to it and we can shut down their access. No. For thousands of years, people weren't being addicted. And remember the Chinese laborers. They worked for six days out on the, on the uh, tracks, laying track without any opiate. On their day off, they went in and smoked, and uh, it's just like the farmhands going in and drinking and playing poker in the Wild West. What did they do? They went back the rest of the week, and they were working on the farm. They weren't alcoholics. The Chinese were not drug addicts. It was a release, a relaxation. And people have used this for thousands of years without ever getting addicted. The phenomenon of addiction is mostly a result of prohibition. It is an economic effect of the iron law of prohibition. It's economics that kills people here. And we're going to talk in the next installment about a lot of the economic side of this and how we go about changing things. Until next time, take a look at those links below. Join me on MeWe or on Parlay, the new non-censoring, non-tracking versions of Facebook and Twitter. But if you must use the old left-wing censoring versions, we're still on Facebook and at VidZet on Twitter. The message is what matters. I'm Dr. Ted Noel. Thanks for watching.